Kurt Busch announced that he will retire from NASCAR and 2311 Racing is not expected to switch to Ford in 2024 and Stuart Racing is not expected to sell any charters for 2024. What's going on guys? It's Daniel and welcome back to our video. We got some NASCAR and other motorsports story discussed here today on the channel. Let's go ahead and just show them those really, really quickly. We're going to go ahead and start and talk about FanDuel. As it was announced on Friday that FanDuel has announced a partnership with NASCAR's announced partnership with FanDuel as authorized gaming operator of NASCAR. FanDuel has been the biggest uh, company when it comes to betting odds for races. This is a really, really huge deal. And nonetheless, I think it's really cool to see that NASCAR has announced a partnership with this company. I think it's a really, really big deal. Really happy for them. And nonetheless, glad to see that FanDuel is going to become the official gambling and gaming partner of NASCAR. This is really, really awesome stuff. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Dutch Grand Prix. As of course on Sunday we have the F1 race in Zandvoort for the Dutch Grand Prix. And it was a very, very interesting and compelling race. Well, at the end of the day though, Max Verstappen put up a dominating clinic and picked up his ninth straight Formula 1 victory, tying the record for most wins in a row with Alberto Ascari, who won I think in 1950 or 1951, and Sebastian Vettel, who won nine straight in 2013. Max Evan is likely to win the Formula 1 championship. I will say, though, it was a more compelling race, probably the most interesting Formula 1 race we've probably seen so far in the 2023 calendar year. But likely at this point, Max Evan is going to win the championship. And nonetheless, congratulations to Max Verstappen on winning the race in Zambor. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the IndyCar race and Worldwide Technology Raceway. We had an IndyCar race also yesterday afternoon as well, where the Truck Series race was going on, a Worldwide Technology race with three races to go in the IndyCar Championship. And we saw a very interesting race. Joseph Newgarden dominated early, but at the end of the race, Joseph Newgarden made a major, major mistake getting it to the outside wall. Unfortunately, the caution did not come out for him, but there was too much damage on the car, and this takes him out of contention to win the IndyCar Championship. But the IndyCar Championship is not locked up yet because Scott Dixon put up in a really, really clinic, led over 100 laps, pulled off the field strategy, and would come off the corner to win his second straight race and his 55th career IndyCar Championship. We all think Alex Bowman is easily going to win the championship, but Scott Dixon is here to try to stop that. I think it's really impressive what Scott Dixon was able to do. He Congratulations to Scott Dixon on winning. He's the second ever winner of Worldwide Technology Raceway, I think he's got an outside chance to win. I still think Plo is likely going to lock up the championship, but nonetheless, really, really cool and awesome to see that Scott Dixon was able to win at Worldwide Technology Raceway. Really awesome and amazing stuff. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Michael McDowell. Now, before the NASCAR Cup Series race took place on Saturday evening, earlier in the day, Michael McDowell got a really cool celebration. He finally got to celebrate his 2021 Daytona 500 win with his family. Obviously, in 2021, when he won the Daytona 500, his family could not be there due to the COVID-19 protocols. So it's really awesome and amazing to see that Michael McDowell he got to finally celebrate with his family. It was really cool that Daytona did that. That's what I love about Frank Keller and his team is they're doing really cool things over there. And I think this is such no exception. I think this is amazing. I think it's incredible. And nonetheless, huge congratulations. Congratulations to Michael McDowell on that, and really awesome to see his family finally got to celebrate that Daytona 500 win. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Martin Truex Jr. As after the end of stage number two, Martin Truex Jr. was officially announced to be the 2023 NASCAR Cup Series regular season champion. He will get 15 extra playoff points going into the playoffs. This did not surprise. He had a 39-point lead coming into the playoffs. He won stage one earlier in the race as well. So nonetheless, huge and massive congratulations to Mark Trix Jr. on winning the regular season championship. He absolutely deserves it. And I think Mark Trix Jr. might have to be the championship favorite currently at the moment. It's a huge deal for him. I think he's got a really great chance, a really great opportunity to win the championship. That extra 15 playoff points is really going to go a long way. Nonetheless, massive and huge congratulations to Mark Trix Jr. on winning the 2023 NASCAR Cup Series regular season championship. Huge congratulations to him on that. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Chase Elliott. With Chase Elliott not picking up the NASCAR Cup Series win at Daytona International Speedway this weekend, Chase Elliott unfortunately will miss the 2023 NASCAR Cup Series playoffs. Really unfortunate situation. This is the first time in his NASCAR Cup Series career that he's missing the playoffs, but he gave it his all. He had a really good run at Daytona International Speedway. 
and unfortunately just did not have enough. He ran top five. I think he led a few laps while Daytona was probably the best driver who had a chance to make it in on a must-win situation. Besides Bob Wallace, probably the best former there. Unfortunately, though, when you had the RFK duo of Chris Buescher and Bragg Zossi, we're going to talk about here in just a little bit. When you have those guys on the outside, it's not a really major shock and a really big surprise that Chase Elliott could not get it done. It was going to be really tough to beat that RFK duo. Obviously, I think a lot of Chase Elliott fans are really, really disappointed. And I'm also a Chase Elliott fan as well. But I think now Chase Elliott's goal is to just try to win. He's still competing for the owner's championship, so at least that's a positive right there for him. At least at this point, Chase Elliott just needs to go out there and do the best he can. Try to go out there and see if he can win races and try to see if he can get a lot of momentum. He could pull off a Tony Stewart 2006 season by winning a lot of races. And I feel like that this 19 is capable of doing that. So we'll see what happens. But unfortunately, Chase Elliott will not race in the 2023 NASCAR Cup Series Plus, which is disappointing. But now the remaining focus is to try to go out there and win. So we'll see what happens and we'll see if Chase Elliott can go out there and do that. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Bubba Walls. While Chase Lake did miss the playoffs, Bubba Walls has officially made the 2023 NASCAR Cup Series playoffs. This is the first time that Bubba Walls has been able to make the NASCAR Cup Series playoffs. Huge and massive congratulations to Bubba Walls. He got swarmed on pit road by media. He got congratulated by Denny Hamlin, his teammate Tyler Reddick, and also Michael Jordan came up and gave him a handshake and gave him a hug as well. I've been a big Bubba Walls fan for about 10 years now. So when I saw Bubba Walls be able to get into the playoffs this year, I was really excited and really, really happy. And he absolutely deserves it. He's been in the top 16 points pretty much for the second half of the regular season. And while they haven't been as fast at times they were last year at this point, they have been extremely consistent. If you're going to make a run of the playoffs, you have to be really, really consistent. And they did what they had to do. And I know some people are predicting that Bubba Walls is not going to make it far this year, but I think Bubba Walls could make a decent playoff run. There's a lot of good tracks in the playoffs for him. He finished third at Darlington earlier this year, and he won at Kansas last fall. So I think Bubba Walls will have a really good chance and a really strong possibility. I think he absolutely deserves it. He's earned the right to be in the playoffs this year, and I cannot wait to see what Bubba Walls can do in the playoffs this year. I'm excited about it. I'm stoked for him, and nonetheless, really glad and happy to see that he will get to race in the playoffs in 2023. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about IndyCar. Now, it was a poor man Marshall Pruitt from Racer Magazine that IndyCar is looking at a potential charter concept. Now, in NASCAR, we have the charter system. And what does the charter system guarantee? Well, you get a certain amount of money that you do get after every race, but you also get locked into every single race as well. Because of the amount of entries that are showing up to the IndyCar races, they're talking about locked-in spots. On top of that, there might be locked-in spots for the Indy 500 as well. I'm going to be perfectly honest. I think that this is a bad call if IndyCar was to go to a charter concept because no one should be guaranteed in the races. Number one, most races you're not going to get full fields, right? But you're getting more and more expanded fields that are showing up. And I think for the Indy 500 especially, everyone should be able to lock their... You should not be guaranteed a spot into the Indy 500 automatically. If you're a slower car, you shouldn't be able to make it in. I just don't like the fact that any car is looking at this. I think that this overall would be a really, really bad and a terrible car on IndyCar's part. I know that they're just looking at it. They haven't announced anything, but this would be a really, really bad move. IndyCar has been making some pretty good moves recently, but if they decided to go to a charter concept, I just think it would not be a good move overall for the IndyCar series. So I hope they don't go to this. I know it's just something they're talking about, but I really hope and pray that IndyCar says, you know what, we're not going to do this. It would be a really bad move on IndyCar's part, and hopefully they say, you know what, we are not going to do this. But I've seen them do some crazy things before. Let's hope IndyCar, though, makes the right decision, and they decide not to go ahead and do this. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Brad Keselowski. Now, NBC did not mention this much during the broadcast, but if you watch Under the Red Flag, you saw Brad Keselowski spinning in a circle and was down at the bottom of the racetrack. Now, it was reported in multiple people that Brad Keselowski's car had actually caught fire. And basically, Brad Keselowski was spinning that car 
to extinguish the fire. Now, a lot of people are wondering why did Bragzowski not get a penalty? Well, NASCAR did say that in, this is a rare occurrence when they did this, but they let allow Bragzowski to do that because for a safety reason. They didn't want to, because his car was on fire. They didn't want to go ahead and bring a bunch of safety trucks out there, it seemed like, and they thought, you know what, let's go ahead and let Bragzowski do this to get rid of this fire. It's a very dangerous situation. I'm glad to see the NASCAR let him do that. Be again, it's one of those rare instances where I think a lot of fans are going to be okay with it because certainly you don't want a car catching on fire. Because again, there's been issues with this next-gen car. We've seen in the past where cars are caught on fire. And the manufacturer, it seems most likely that gets caught on fire with this situation, is the Ford. We saw Kevin Harvick last year catch on fire for whatever reason. Chris Buescher after the Indy Road Course had issues. I think Joe Logano's car caught on fire as well. There were a lot of cars that did end up catching on fire last year. So it's very interesting to see that any car let it happen. But I don't think anybody really has a problem with that. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Ryan Blaney. Now, Ryan Blaney coming to the end of stage number two had a really, really bad and really big wreck. As Chris Bell gave a really bad push to Ty Gibbs in the corner and spun Ty Gibbs out, not intentionally, but spun Ty Gibbs out and Ty Gibbs unfortunately clipped Ryan Blaney and Ryan Blaney hit the outside wall really, really hard. Now, the save barrier did its job and it seemed like the front clips did a much better job giving in. And Ryan Blaney spoke to me after the crash, and he is happy with the new front clip design and the safer barrier after the crash. He's very thankful that he is okay. Obviously, with the National Guard, there has been a lot of safety issues we're going to talk about here in just a little bit with Ryan Priest. But Ryan Blaney was able to walk away from it. It said, again, the hit was really, really hard, but the front did its job, and the car absolutely did its job in this situation. We're lucky we didn't have any serious injuries from this crash. We're very lucky for that. And as a sport, again, we've had a lot of really, really big wrecks and really big crashes that have taken place. And Ryan Blaney has had a lot of big wrecks this year. You go back to National or this year when he hit the inside wall really, really hard. The fact there were no safety barriers there, he said it hurt, and he definitely stung for sure. We've seen a lot of other drivers have injuries this year. Denny Hamlin on his podcast kind of talked about he's still lingering from an injury. He has lingering feet, still hurt a lot from his crash with Chase Lee in the Coke State Center, where Chase Lee intentionally dumped him going down the straightaway. So... In my opinion, it's good to see that he's okay and no serious injuries were from that. Nonetheless, glad to see that he was able to walk away from that. Both drivers were able to, and nonetheless, glad to see that the car did its job and did what it was supposed to do. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Chase Elliott. Now, throughout the week on social media, I saw a lot of people saying that Alan Gustin needed to be fired after what happened at Watkins Glen. Well, Chase Elliott spoke about that and called out a lot of these people as well. And he says that he and Alan Gusman have a great relationship and says Gusman is a good crew chief. Look, did Alan Gusman make a little bit of a mistake at Watkins Glen? Yes. But let's be honest, Alan Gusman is not the reason that Chase Elliott missed the playoffs. And I saw people bring up statistics on social media as well, trying to say, oh, Alan Gusman is not very good. Alan Gusman is the second winningest crew chief currently in the NASCAR Cup Series garage with 38 wins. People are saying, oh, he couldn't win a lot of races with Kyle Busch, who, by the way, was in the first three years of his NASCAR Cup Series career when he did that. And guess what? Kyle was still won four races at Gustafson. He won, almost won a championship in 2009 with Mark Martin. And then in 2011, 2014, and 2015, Jeff Gordon, near the end of his career, had a career resurgence with Alan Gustafson and nearly won championships in all three of those years. And then in 2020, he won the championship with Chase Elliott. On top of that as well, last year, he won the regular season championship and won five races. It's not like Alan Gustafson is a bad crew chief. He's a great crew chief and as a NASCAR Hall of Fame caliber year as a crew chief. Again, has this year been a good year? No, but it's not just Alan Gustafson's fault that Chase Lee missed the playoffs this year. Chase Lee missed the playoffs by having that skiing or snowboarding accident and basically missed the playoffs by right rear and Denny Hamill down the straightaway intentionally. So Chase Lee is also to blame. I think the whole night team in general is to blame, but for people saying that Alan Gustafson needs to be fired, I think that's a BS move in my opinion. I don't like the fact that people are calling for his job. I think that's a bad call on everybody's part. And to me, no one, it, to me, it's just the whole 19 didn't have a good year. Chase Elliott had, didn't have a good year as well. So Chase Elliott fans need to blame Chase Elliott for his mistakes as well and stop blaming Alan Gusman because even Chase Elliott likes Alan Gusman. He should not be fired. So that would be really, really stupid and that would be a really, really bad call if they were to fire him because in my opinion, it's not Chase Elliott. It's not Alan Gusman's fault that Chase Elliott missed the playoffs. 
And now we're going ahead to move on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Ty Majeski. Now, he had the NASCAR Cup and Xfinity Series in Daytona, but he had the Truck Series racing in Milwaukee Mile for the first time since 2009. And there is a huge potential penalty that is coming for Ty Majeski, who's already locked in to the next round and could be receiving some huge penalties. Now, why could he be receiving some huge penalties? Well, according to Pete Stone and other reporters, he messed with one of the three big Holy Trinity things, which is the tires. They confiscated one of the tires from Ty Majeski, and he received a pass-through penalty for the race started. He was able to qualify, but he had to basically go sheer could not basically be there to crew chief the race, and there were a bunch of other things that are coming down the line potentially, and there's huge penalties that could be coming really, really soon. Some are saying that he could receive a huge playoff penalty where he basically, while he is locked into the next round, he may be already facing a must-win situation going into the next round. And it's totally unnecessary for a team like this when they're already locked into the next round. You're not going to go out there. You don't need to do stupid stuff like this. It could have been something that had an advantage in Milwaukee, and it could have been something they had advantage at, at Richmond. But to me, if they mess with stuff at Richmond and Milwaukee, I would at other tracks as well, that's something that's really going to hurt this team. And in my opinion, they are potentially going to get some huge and massive penalties. And I just think it's unnecessary to mess with the car. Don't mess with these cars. I don't care what series it is. If you mess with one of the Holy Trinity, you're going to get huge penalties. So there's a good chance he's going to receive a huge penalty. Could they remove his playoff eligibility? I don't think they're going to do that. I don't think NASCAR is going to go to that extreme to remove his playoff eligibility. But again, you're not supposed to mess with these trucks or cars or anything like that. The National Car would be worse penalties if they were messing with the tires. But this is one thing you're not supposed to mess with. And they did mess with it. And it honestly... If they get penalized, it's their fault, unfortunately. It's disappointing stuff if they get penalized. But again, you cannot mess with these cars or trucks or anything like that in any shape or form. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Grant Enfinger. Now, yesterday, the NASCAR Truck Series race took place, and Grant Enfinger was, go was able to go on and win. His lock his way into the round of eight. He spoke to the media and Jerry Haas from Front Church reported on this that Grant Anfinger does not have a ride yet for 2024. Obviously, it's already been announced earlier this week that GMS Racing is going to shut down at the end of the year. A big reason why GMS Racing is shutting down at the end of this year is because Legacy Motor Club is going to be switching to Toyota. And they, are, of course, already have a Toyota team in the truck series, that, of course, being Tricon Garage, being the main Toyota team. And GMS Racing is also shutting down the fabrication shop as well. This will affect teams like Bill McAnally Racing, basically the, the CR7 Motorsports Organization, and also a couple other teams, are, and Brett Holmes' team is also being affected by that as well. Now, do I think Grant Enfinger is going to find a ride for next year? Absolutely. Grant Enfinger has already won three races this year in the Truck Series, and he's been doing a really awesome and really good job in the 2023 NASCAR Truck Series season. So I easily think Grant Enfinger is going to find a ride. There are going to be truck rides, I think, available. There's been some rumors of some teams that he could go to. I can see him going to CR7 Motorsports next year because Colby Howard has struggled this year. And while I do believe the CR7 isn't the greatest organization in the world, Grant Enfinger's driven for the team and did a really solid job and got a lot of top 10s and even a couple top 5s with this team as well. And we know that Grant Enfinger can easily get the best out of equipment. So I think of all three drivers that are free agents that being Daniel Dyer, though it does sound like Daniel Dyer does have a ride going into next year, and Raj as well, who I also think will have a ride as well. I don't think anybody from the GMS team is going to be in trouble. I think also Jeff Hensley will probably go with Grant Enfinger, as Jeff Hensley and Grant Enfinger have worked together very, very well over the last few years. So we'll see what happens when it comes to Grant Enfinger, but I trust me, I believe Grant Enfinger will find a ride going into next year. I don't see an issue coming in regards to that. I do expect that we are going to see him find a ride for 2023. And now we're going ahead to on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Ross Chastain. Now, it was reported by Toby Christie from the Toby Christie Network that Ross Chastain spoke to the media, and he says that the conversations he had with Rick Kendrick after Darlington earlier in the season was an impactful conversation. He has tried to live by that advice. Obviously, after Darlington, we saw what happened with Kyle Larson and Ross Chastain, where Kyle Larson got walled by Ross Chastain, because Ross Chastain, in the beginning of 2023, was over-aggressive and extremely aggressive. But unfortunately, really ever since that aggression has kind of been taken out of Ross Chastain, his performance has absolutely dipped. Since Darlington, Ross Chastain, I believe, has only scored three top 10 finishes. Now, he has won a race, and that did come at Nashville at the start of the NBC portion of the year. 
But since that time, and I think a lot of the reason why the performance kind of dipped as well for Chastain is because Rick Kendrick had threatened maybe to take a lot of stuff away from Trackhouse Racing. And you look at Trackhouse Racing this year, probably ever since then, they have not had speed to contend for a championship, in my opinion. So are we going to see Rostein up that aggression going into two thousand later this year in the playoffs? I certainly think he might up that aggression to try to make it through the rounds. But it's interesting to see that Rostein has been trying to live by that advice. Do not wreck others and try to do better. Because again, he's not been as aggressive. He's not making a lot of mistakes he made earlier in the year. But I think that's cost him a shot at competing better. I think he wants to race aggressive, but he can't because again, there's a lot of talk that there's a lot of threats they went out and their track us as being threatened to lose a lot of the impact and forms that they have basically been having. So I'm not surprised that Chastain's back out off there. Again, Kyle Rick Hendrick has not usually gotten that mad where he gets frustrated at other drivers for being over aggressive. He usually doesn't get pissed. So when you have Rick Hendrick being upset, you need to listen to Rick Hendrick. So in my opinion, it's definitely very, very interesting. Do I see, like I said, I think Rostin is going to up that aggression just a little bit. He's trying to be a little more aggressive on the track, but he's also trying not to wreck others and get others pissed off. And that's why I think Rostin is backed off just a bit. Maybe track is saving some stuff for the playoffs. Who knows at this point, but nonetheless, it's interesting to see Rosh Hussain had that conversation with Rick Hendrick, but you can definitely tell their performance has dipped just a little bit from that organization. And at this point, I think it's a very interesting thing to continue watching going forward, and we'll see if their performance does pick up later this year. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Ryan Priest. Now, we do have a couple Ryan Priest stories that we're going to talk about in today's episode, but the first story we're talking about is the crash that took place at Daytona International Speedway. Coming to five laps ago, Ryan Priest was behind, I think, Chase Briscoe, and Ryan Priest got a huge push from Eric Jones going down the back stretch, and unfortunately, Eric Jones just clipped, I think, the right rear of that car and spun Ryan Priest out. And Ryan Priest suffered 15 to 20 flips went upside down, over and in and out, and suffered the worst wreck of the next-gen era and one of the worst crashes I have seen as a race fan. Now, Ryan Priest able to get out of the car, but he laid down and was basically laid down into the stretcher and was taken to the infield care center. Then he was transported to a local hospital. But luckily, Ryan Priest yesterday morning, not even 24 hours after the crash, was released from the hospital. He also put out a tweet basically saying that basically, yeah, you need to be tough if you're going to be in one of these race cars. First of all, I am glad to see that Ryan Priest is okay. and he's, We're not sure if he'll be racing this week or not. I would expect that Ryan Priest, he says he's coming back, which tells me that he does want to race in next this week's Southern 500. But Southern 500 is going to be another tough race, and it's going to be a grueling race with a lot of attrition, among other things. The fact that Ryan Priest is able to walk away from that car does show that the next-gen car has gotten a lot better when it comes to safety. That was one of the scariest wrecks I have seen as a race fan, and it's just an awful and really, really bad wreck. I think we are very, very lucky there weren't any serious injuries from that, because that could have been really much worse than it ended up being. The fact he got out of the car it, it is a really good sign. Again, I believe one of the reasons why he was taken to the Halifax Medical Center was basically just as a safety precaution, which I think is a really good decision that they made. you got to be really safe in these situations. It seemed like he got out under his own power, which is a good thing, and hopefully we see Ryan Priest race this week. Again, we're not sure at this point if that is going to happen. I do expect that he will race, but we'll have to keep an eye on that. So it's one thing to watch for sure. We'll see what happens in regards to that, but I'm glad to see Ryan Priest got out of the hospital. It's really, really good stuff, and happy to see Ryan Priest has been cleared to go home. He was able to go home last night for the Halifax Medical Center, and honestly, I'm just really happy because that was a really really scary and really really bad wreck in my opinion and now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about spire motorsports now austin Gadinsky from motorsports wire also known as us today put out an article in regards to spire motorsports and according to him bob pockers went on serious him to ask for radio and bob pockers says that he's expecting that spire motorsports will likely go full-time truck series racing in 2024. Now, Spire Motorsports opened up a truck series team in 2022, had them part-time with drivers like Roger Carew. I think also Kyle Larson ran a race for two, Chase Elliott ran a race for the team, and also William Byron drove that truck in 2022, and we saw William Byron win at Martinsville. Then in 2023, he's seen him run a few more races. Derek Krause has ran a race here. Lane Riggs has ran a race to the team. Kyle Larson's also ran a race or two with the organization and has gone on to win with the team at North Wilkesboro and also saw Corey LaJoy run a few races with the organization as well, along with Jonathan Davenport. Now, they've obviously been rumored they wanted to maybe go full-time in 2023, but they're not able to do that. So now the big question revolves around who's going to get into the seven truck. Well, there's a lot of drivers that could be available. 
What about Daniel Dye? Daniel Dye has already announced he does have a full-time ride for 2024. I could see him potentially being the driver that does get behind the wheel of that number seven truck in 2024 on a full-time basis. What about Roger Carew? Roger Carew does not have a full-time ride for 2024 currently at the moment, and I would have to imagine that this number seven truck is definitely a really big chance and a really big possibility because seven truck is really, really quick. And I don't know what Roger could do in a few races. He ran for Spire Motorsports last year at Gateway and also was pretty fast at Phoenix as well. I could see him getting a ride with this team full-time. What about Grant Enfinger? Grant Enfinger does not have a ride currently moment for 2024. I could definitely see him getting a chance and an opportunity. But I think someone that also needs to be considered is Marco Andretti. Obviously, we know Spire Motorsports has a big partnership now with Gamebridge. Obviously, the co-owner of that, Dan Townis, is also co-owner of Andretti Autosport at this point. And we also saw Marco Andretti make his NASCAR Truck Series debut with that said team. So I think there's a really great chance and a really strong possibility that we're going to maybe see Marco Andretti go full-time. Because Marco Andretti has said publicly, and he said that at Mid-Ohio, that he wants to run full-time next year in NASCAR is looking to maybe go full-time in NASCAR in the 2024 season. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with Fire Motorsports. I'm glad to see you're looking to go full-time. Obviously, GMS Racing is not going to be back next year in the Truck Series. So glad to see at least there will be a new Truck Series team coming into play. I would imagine that Hendrick is going to work with that seven team as well because obviously Spire has a big alliance with Hendrick Motorsports. I would expect maybe Andretti Autosport maybe comes into play and works with the team as well. With that Group 1001 sponsorship, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in regards to that. But it looks like Spire Motorsports is looking to go full-time next year. And honestly, I am definitely for that. And now we're going ahead to on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Indy Oval. Now, Kevin Harvick was speaking to the media in a press conference, and he says that he's glad that he doesn't have to race on the Indy IMS road course ever again. Now, also was reported by Chris Sider in this same tweet that the IMS Oval is expected to likely return in 2024. A couple weeks ago, after the Indy road course race took place for 2023, when Michael Madow went on to win that race, we saw them go ahead and have an oval test. There's been heavily rumors that the Breakout 400 is likely going to return in the 2024 season, which will be the 30-year anniversary of the Breakout 400. Now, do not get me wrong. Did I like the IMS road course race we had this year? Yes, I thought the road course race this year was very, very good. Well, not very good, but it's definitely a really solid race. Had a solid finish. It was very intriguing because you had three drivers fighting for the playoffs, that being Daniel Suarez, Chase Elliott, and Daniel Suarez, and, and Michael Medall, of course, who were all fighting to get a playoff spot and were looking to get a win to lock their way into the playoffs. It was a very intriguing race. But I think that the Oval had, needs to come back for a lot of reasons. Number one, traditional sake. Tradition is a big reason. We've had to break our from 1994 up to 2020, and I think it makes a lot of sense for the 30-year anniversary. The second reason, TV ratings. TV ratings on the IMS Oval for the Brickyard 400 were in a 4 to 5 million viewership range. For the Indy Road Course, it was like in a 2 to 2.5 million range. I think it might have been up a little bit, or actually it was down a little bit, if I'm not mistaken, because I think some markets were taken out. Ratings is a big reason. But a third reason is if the Breakout 400 does come back, you can market that and put the Breakout 400 and the Daytona cutoff race right next to each other. And that could be a huge push going into the playoffs as well. Having back-to-back road course races did not get your hype going up. And that was, I think, the first since 1978 that we had that where you had back-to-back races on a road course, if I'm not mistaken. So to me... I just think with the Indy Oval Life come back, I think it will be better racing. I think we need to see how the next gen car races there as well. Do I think it's going to be all time classic? <clears throat> Absolutely not. But I do think the racing will at least be a little bit better than what we have seen. So I'm very intrigued to see what happens when it comes to the Indy Oval. Sounds very likely that that is coming back in the 2024 season, which I think would be a really awesome, a really good decision to bring it back. I think ratings would be better, and I think the next car also would, in general, race a lot better as well. So we'll see what happens, but it sounds very likely that it is coming back in 2024. And overall, I think it will be really, really awesome and great decision if it does end up returning. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Brandon Jones. As Brandon Jones confirmed with Dalton Hopkins from Front Stretch that he will return to Junior Motorsports in 2024 in the number nine car. According to Brandon Jones, he has a two year deal with Junior Motorsports, meaning he will be back from 2024. Now, I'm happy to see that Brandon Jones is coming back to Junior Motorsports. Don't get me wrong. But if you want my honest opinion, Brandon Jones has not had a good year with Junior Motorsports. 
Expectations of Brandon Jones, while not expected to be a contender, will maybe be at least contend for a championship. We thought maybe he'd be a little bit faster and run better than he has this year. And Brandon Jones has not delivered that promise this year in 2023. He has failed to go on and win races this year. He's basically outside plus. He's over 100 points back of the cutoff line, I believe, going at this moment. And he needs to win in either Kansas or Darlington. Now, luckily for Brandon Jones, those two tracks are really good for him. He won a Darlington in 2020 when Rochester and Danny Hamlin were battling for the win. And he also has won a Kansas two or three times. Kansas is his best track. And you know who won the race last year? The number nine team did. So I think Brandon Jones does have a chance to win. But I think that next year will be his last chance because honestly, he's not raced really good with the 19. But I hope that he can do better in 2024 because he's just had overall a really disappointing year in the NASCAR Xfinity Series. It hasn't happened for him yet at this point. It's just, it's not worked out really well. And it's a shame too because you go back to last year, Brandon Jones. Brandon Jones had a very good year in the Xfinity Series last year. Scored that win in Marzell and had a chance to make it to the championship four. So it's not like Brandon Jones is a bad driver. It just seems like this year it hasn't clicked for him. He's had a good crew chief in Jason Burdett as well. So I've been really shocked and surprised to see their performance of that number nine, of that number nine team. They just haven't had a good year. Very similar to Chase Elliott with the nine team at Hendrick Motorsports. It's been very disappointing to see this team struggle as much as they have because all three of the other junior motorsports drivers this year have done a better job including Josh Brady hasn't won this year. Sam Mayer has gotten two wins this year in the one team, and Justin Allgaier has gotten two wins now. He, of course, won at Daytona this past week. And so I really hope that they can figure something out going to next year. Maybe a crew chief change should, should probably happen, but I don't know if crew chief change really needs to happen because you look at this year, they have a good crew chief working this year. So I don't know at this point what needs to happen. We'll see what happens, So, but hopefully we can see better performance from Brandon Jones because let's be honest, it has not been a good year for Brandon Jones in 2023. He needs to do better, and let's be honest, it has not been a good year. So it's been a frustrating year and not a good year for Brandon Jones at this point. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Ryan Priest. And I've already talked about Ryan Priest with the crash. But now we're talking about Ryan Priest in a little more of a positive light. As was reported from French, I think Dalton Hopkins and French Church have reported on this as well. But according to him, Ryan Priest says he's pretty close to signing an extension with Stuart Haas Racing for 2024. Obviously, Ryan Priest currently drives the number 41 car for Stuart Haas Racing. And it's no secret that Ryan Priest hasn't had the greatest year in 2023. But I am not going to put blame on Ryan Priest for the lack of performance this year. I'm putting more blame on Stuart Haas Racing. Stuart Haas Racing in the 2023 year, they have not had a good year. Even Kevin Harvick, who's been a championship threat pretty much every year he's been in that number four car, I don't think he's a championship threat this year. He's been eighth or ninth in the points, and Kevin Harvick right now is like maybe like nine or ten points above, but he's really not kind of near that cutoff line, and he's got good tracks in the round of 16, don't get me wrong. But Kevin Harvick, outside of a really strong run at Phoenix and a really strong run at Auto Club, has not had a chance to win races in 2023. And we see what Ryan Priest can do when he has really strong and really, really good equipment. If you give him the right stuff and the right equipment, he is going to compete really, really well for you. So I think Ryan Priest definitely deserves an extension to stay with Super Haas Racing because we're going to talk about SHR and some of the rumors revolving around that team. Because there have been some rumors and rumors that Super Haas Racing was going to downsize, maybe down to two cars, maybe sell some charters. But it's good to see at least that Ryan Priest wants to come back. And Tony Stewart is a huge reason why Ryan Priest is on this team this year. Because Tony Stewart is a big reason why bringing Ryan Priest in. And let's be honest, I think Ryan Priest has been better this year than what Cole Custer had done in the previous years. Yes, of course, Cole Custer did win at Kentucky in 2020. But let's be honest, it was kind of a fluke win. Yes, he did make a really impressive move on the outside. Made that four-wide move for the lead in 2020 at Kentucky, which was really, really impressive. The last race, of course, at Kentucky Speedway. But nonetheless, I think it's good to see that Ryan Priest is likely going to get an extension. I think he deserves an extension with the team. I think he deserves to stay with the organization. And I would like for him to stay. I think he deserves it. I think he deserves to stay with the organization. I think he will get better in 2024. So I think SHR hopefully will improve. We'll see what happens with the team, though. But again, I'm glad at least see that Ryan Priest is like come back to SHR. My guess announcement is probably coming sometime in early September because I think a lot of the announcements are coming relatively soon. A lot of teams expect to make some major announcements when it comes to silly season. It sounds like it's very likely at this point that Ryan Priest is going to return to Stewart Haas Racing in the 2024 season. So we'll see what happens. We'll see when it comes to extension. But nonetheless, I'm glad to see that it's very likely at this point that Ryan Priest is going to return to Stewart Haas Racing in the 2024 
NASCAR Cup Series season. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Colleg Racing. Now, there's been a lot of questions involving who is going to be driving a 31 car for Colleg Racing in 2024. Well, according to Austin NC from Sportsnet, we saw Chris Reichs go on Sirius and NASCAR Radio. And he says their driver for 31 car is ready to be announced. Announcement, though, is not expected for the next few weeks. But according to Chris Rice, he says that the name could be very, very surprising and who could be driving a 31 car in 2024. We all thought it was going to be Austin Hills driving a 31 car for 2024. We know about a week or two ago. It was announced that Austin Hill has signed a multi-year contract extension for Rich Schultz Racing, and we know that he'll be driving the number 21 car next in 2024. We could see Austin Hill in Cup in 2025 if Rich Schultz Racing does acquire a charter, but it sounds like that that is not likely going to happen at least for the next years because Austin Dillon is going to be in that three car at least for 2025, and Kyle Busch is going to finish his career at Richard Toast Racing. So the big question is who's going to drive a 31 car? Well, I think there's a lot of drivers who could have an opportunity and a chance. Maybe Chandler Smith. Chandler Smith currently drives the number 16 car for Cog Racing in the NASCAR Xfinity Series, and he's had a couple really solid races in the Cup Series so far, so maybe he gets a chance and opportunity and gets called up to drive that car. Maybe Daniel Hemrick. Daniel Hemrick's got sponsorship and funny, but there's been rumors he could be out at the end of this year. So maybe he gets out, even though he's got sponsorship with Circle and a couple other companies that work with him, but he might be out at the end of the year. Maybe SVG, but SVG is likely that being Shane Van Gisbergen, but Shane Van Gisbergen obviously is signing is going to sign a deal with Trackhouse where we'll have a development deal. We'll probably race a car in the Xfinity Series and also race with Nice Motorsports and Trucks, but also race with Trackhouse on a part-time basis in 2024. Maybe Matt Benedetto. Matt Benedetto hasn't signed a contract yet for 2024 currently at the moment. We're not sure we'll be back at Radley next year or not. He's been, once I think he wants to stay in the trucks from what I understand. But I also think it'd be cool for him to go full-time cup racing, but you're going to need sponsorship and funding. But a name that I've heard is Justin Allgaier. Justin Allgaier, I've heard some rumors he could be out of junior motorsports at the end of this year. And maybe he goes to Call of Racing's cup team. He's got sponsorship funding with Brandt. And as a driver who I think has deserved a chance and opportunity to run full-time Cup Series once again, it'd be very interesting. Maybe they also decide to do the rotation because here's the thing with Colic. They also haven't announced who's going to be in the 16 car because A.J. Allmendinger is not officially said yet that he's going to be back in the 16 car next year in 2024. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in regards to who ends up in the 31 car next year. But announcement is not expected until probably the second or third week of September. We're probably going to be knowing that here soon. I've already talked about with the Ryan Priest stuff. We're expecting a lot of silly season announcement coming in the next few weeks and the next few months as well. So I think it's very interesting to see who gets into that number 31. I'm thinking Justin Allgaier may be the favorite, which shocks a lot of people because he's been with Junior Motorsports since 2016 season when he drove the number 7 car. But I've been hearing some stuff that there could be some big shuffles coming at Junior Motorsports. Obviously, we all thought maybe Brandon Jones going back to JHR. That's not going to be happening. So we'll see what happens in regards to that. But nonetheless, it sounds like at this point that we're going to know who the third driver of 31 car is relatively soon. A lot of people think it could be Justin Allgaier, but we'll see what happens in regards to who gets a 31 car. I also mentioned Noah Gregson because Noah Gregson has been mentioned quite a bit. I think he's got some sponsors. I thought he may be a driver to get the 31 car, but we'll have to see what happens in regards to who drives the 31 car in the 2024 NASCAR Cup Series season. And now we're going to edge up onto the first of two major stories in today's episode as we're talking about Kurt Busch. Now, Unfortunately, it was confirmed on Saturday, and I did a video already talking about this, but unfortunately, Kurt Busch will retire from NASCAR. Kurt Busch, unfortunately, is not medically cleared to return to the NASCAR Cup Series. And there's a little more stuff and information that we got on Saturday during the press conference. As he was reading the base of the announcement, he would be retiring from the NASCAR Cup Series. He was getting very choked up and very, very emotional hearing all the people that were in the room, and basically was getting very emotional during the thing. Now, he is expected to still remain at 2311 Racing in some sort of capacity. He's basically the advisor guy and has worked with 2311 Racing. You look at 2311 Racing, how much this team has improved. I think a big reason why 2311 Racing has improved. Both cars made the playoffs here, and you've had a third car show up for drivers like Kamui Kobayashi. And there's been heavy rumors that Carl Edwards could maybe make a return at some point in the future with this organization. But Kurt Busch absolutely 
Um, basically, he's still working with 23 Live and has done a great job with them. But he revealed some very interesting information as well. He apparently has been dealing with arthritis. He's been dealing with that really throughout this year. And he's had good flare-ups and almost had a hard time walking and getting into the car before this concussion stuff really came into play. And he says it feels like a Hollywood movie going out on top, going for the pull of Pocono. It feels like he's going out on top. And then during driver intros, or basically during the driver's meeting, he received a standing ovation from the garage and from the industry as well. To be honest, Kurt Busch, it feels like a little bit of a tragedy to see that he is retiring. Kurt Busch, in my opinion, is one of the most underappreciated and one of the most underrated people in this sport. Kurt Busch, you can make a Hollywood movie off of his career. From where it began, he started off as someone who was a hothead. He basically was a really talented driver, won a lot of truck races for Roush. And he basically went on to win a Cup Series championship in 2004, won 34 NASCAR Cup Series races, and also won the Cup Series championship in 2004, and won with most organizations that he drove for. He won with Team Penske, won with Roush, won with Super Haas Racing, won with 23 Live Racing, almost won with Furniture Racing in 2013, had eight outside poles. And I remember 2012 with Phoenix Racing, which I think was one of the most impressive performances when he went out there and almost won. With then, you know, Power Series, some sort of issues on that car, and he still ended up finishing in third place with Phoenix Racing. And then, of course, a 2311, and then also won with Chip Ganassi Racing. Got Chip Ganassi Racing's final win in the NASCAR Cup Series in 2021 and Atlanta Motor Speedway. Kurt Busch always got the best out of equipment, and in my opinion, is a first ballot Hall of Famer. But it sucks seeing that this is truly it for Kurt Busch, as I was really hoping for Kurt to come back. Now, Kurt Busch is hoping to come back in some sort of capacity in racing. Maybe he does at one point come back to NASCAR, but I'll be honest, I think he's done racing in NASCAR. And honestly, I really hope that we can see Kurt Busch at some point become like a co-owner of 2311 Racing. He's been a higher up at that team, working as an advisor role. I would love to see Kurt Busch become an owner of 23 Live of Racing, but it just sucks to see that this is truly it for Kurt Busch. And so many drivers that I've grown up watching over the years are retiring. Guys like Tony Stewart, Dale Jr., Jeff Gordon, Jimmy Johnson from Full Time Racing, Ryan Newman, Carl Edwards, uh, basically guys like Clint Boyer, and eventually guys like Denny Hellen and Kyle Busch and also Matt Kenseth have retired. At some point, the Denny Hellen and Kyle Busch are going to retire. Mark Trick Jr. is going to retire. Guys, I grew up watching the sport when I started watching about 15 years ago, or 16 years ago, I should say. I've grown up watching a guy like Kurt Busch, and again, I wasn't a big fan of Kurt Busch when I became a fan of NASCAR, but I've become more than ever a fan of Kurt Busch over these last 10 years, and it's just incredible to see the comeback of Kurt Busch, the redemption arc, become one of the most popular drivers in the sport. He was one of the most hated drivers in the sport in the early 2000s and was a hothead back in the day. But to see the redemption arc and the redemption story of Kurt Busch and the respect that a lot of fans have for Kurt Busch now is absolutely amazing and incredible. And seeing all the people in, in the industry congratulate him on an incredible career. He's helped drivers like Kyle Larson. He was teammates of Kyle Larson in 2019 and made Kurt Busch, not Kurt Busch, made Kyle Larson a much better driver. He's teammates of Bubba Walls. He was teammates with others. He worked with Kyle Busch, helped him at the end of his tour here with Joe Gibbs Racing. And also drove for Kyle Busch as well and got Kyle Busch's only Xfinity win with Kyle Busch Motorsports. Did that in the 54 car. So he's done a lot of great things for the sport. It's sad to see that he's unfortunately retiring. Been a congratulations though to Kurt Busch on a incredible career. I think he absolutely deserves to be a first foul Hall of Famer. Again, congratulations, Kurt, on a really awesome, incredible career. He deserves the respect, and I hope he does become a first battle Hall of Famer in 2025 or 26. And whenever he does become eligible, I'm probably going to get very emotional when it happens. It was a very emotional time for the sport. Kurt, we love you. Thank you for everything you've done. Maybe we'll see you in the Fox Sports booth. They're always talking about having a four-man booth. At some point, having a guest broadcaster. They tried that at Coda. Didn't work out too much. But it sounds like we may see Kurt Busch do some more stuff with Fox in the future. But he's also, of course, still going to be working with 2311 Racing as well. And now we're going ahead and jump on to the final major story of today's episode as we're talking about 2311 Racing and Stuart Haas Racing. Now, we've talked a lot about them on this channel throughout the week. So there's been some rumors and rumblings that 2311 Racing could switch to Ford in 2024. And in addition to that, there's been some Romans rumors that Stuart Haas Racing could sell up to one or two charters heading into 2024. Now, Denny Hamill did speak to the media, and he says that we may be in the future looking to expand and get charters. Is that our main focus right now? No, absolutely not. And according to Jordan Bianchi, he spoke to Steve Lalletta, who is the president of 2311 Racing, 
And Sea of Allada says the 2011 racing is expected to remain with Toyota in 2024, saying, as far as he knows, they are going to stay with Toyota in 2024. In addition to that, he revealed that Stuart Haas Racing Jordan Bianchi revealed on a teardown after the Cup Series race at Daytona concluded, he revealed that Stuart Haas Racing could, is still expected to be a four-car team in 2024, and those rumors that have been reported are not entirely true. Now, why have there been rumors about Super Haas Racing switching to basically, basically switching manufacturing in the future? And why have there been rumors that Super Haas Racing could sell one of their teams going into 2024? Well, according to Jordan Bianchi and many other reporters, it's expected that Eric Amaral is going to retire at the end of the 2023 season. Smithfield is expected to be gone at the end of this year, and Eric Amaral is going to retire. So a lot of people have been speculating that Stuart Ross Racing, because of how much money the charters are going to be now, they've been expecting maybe to sell some charters, but it sounds like there's still going to be a four-car team in 2024. We do know for a fact that we know we know that Josh Berry is going to be in the four-car next year, Ronnie Childers as a crew chief. We also do know that, jo- that Chase Briscoe will be in the 14-car next year as well, and we also do know the fact that that at this point, we're expecting Ryan Priest to come back to the 41 car. There's a lot of speculation on the 10 car. Maybe they do sell one of their charters and maybe give it to another team like 2311 Racing if they were to switch to Ford. We'll get back to them in just a second. But it sounds like Zane Smith is the front runner for the 10 car at this point. But I think there's a lot of uncertainty revolving around Stuart Haas Racing. And now we transition back over to 2311 Racing. Why there have been Roman's rumors about 2311 potentially switching to Ford? Well, one of the big reasons is because 20 through 11 racing, very similar to Denny Hamlin, are both in contract years with Toyota. Now, Denny Hamlin has stated publicly that he his contract is ready to go and he's ready to announce it at this point. But a big reason why he cannot sign that extension yet is because of 20 through 11 racing not having signed their extension with Toyota. I would not be shocked and surprised if there is some tension building. Obviously, Legacy Motor Club is switching to Toyota in the 2024 season. And it sounds like that they're getting a direct line from Toyota. While 2011 Racing, they don't get a direct line from Toyota. They get a direct line from Joe Gibbs Racing. So they're a little frustrated, it seems like, that they don't have that base here not getting a direct line. And they would love to get a direct line. Because they're in the fact that 2011 Racing has also been with them since 2021. But another reason why these rumors had circulated is because of the fact that we know historically that teams that associate themselves with JGR don't last very long. Levine Family Racing announced an alliance with them in 2019. They only lasted two more years. And Brock Chris Rebellion. That Matt the Bandelon team in 2019, then Brock Chris Rebellion, and then they shut down the team. And then you go back to Furniture Row Racing. Furniture Row Racing was with Toyota from 2016 to 2018. Joe Gibbs Racing jacked the price up and also Five Hour Energy left Furniture Row Racing and they shut their team down just a year after. So a lot of people think that this could have happened because of that. But again, I've never said that they officially were going to switch to Fora. I thought there was a chance of it happening. But again, I still have been pretty confident saying that Denny Hamlin is going to turn to JGR. And honestly, if you're in Joe Gibbs Racing's position, you need to keep Denny Hamlin around. Get him this situation done. And maybe try to find a way to work with 2311 Racing to try to get this extension done. Because we are getting into the late portion of August. And the fact that the deal has not been announced yet is kind of crazy. Now, according to what we've been hearing, it sounds like a deal could be, uh, something could be done in the next week or two. Denny Hamlin said we're hoping to have this resolved in the next week or two and get the situation resolved. Again, I think switching to four would be a decent decision for 2311 Racing because they probably would be getting a direct line. And we also do know that Stuart Haas Racing, there's been some rumors and rumors that Stuart Haas Racing could leave them at the end of 2024, but a lot of people have been speculating. But again, you have to also know that Ford and Stuart Haas Racing, it is required for Stuart Haas Racing that they're expected to still have four organizations. But we also know the charters are very expensive right now, where the charter price currently at the moment is 40 to $50 million. Two years ago, that price was between 10 to $15 million. So the charter price has skyrocketed. And a huge reason why those prices have skyrocketed is because of the upcoming TV deal. A TV deal and a revenue deal has not been announced at the moment for 2024. And a deal needs to be done by the end of 2024. And a big reason is because NASCAR, they don't want to make the charters permanent. The teams, they want to make it permanent to get more money going out. And again, I think personally there needs to be more teams that come into play with this TV deal so that maybe can have more money, maybe bigger fields, and also get more teams showing up so teams can expand. We know that RFK, they want to expand. We know 2311 Racing wants to expand. RCR wants to expand, maybe put Austin Hill full-time. Other organizations like Trackhouse Racing, they want to expand. There's a lot of organizations that want to expand 
All Spire Motorsports, I mentioned them, they want to expand. There's a lot of teams and organizations that want to expand. So I think a lot of people have been speculating this because of the fact that Ford in 2011 racing, there have been some rumors about that, but it sounds like at this point that that is not going to be happening. Again, things can change, and as of now, I'm not expecting them to be switching to Ford, but I think there's a lot of stuff that could happen, and Silly Season could get crazier and crazier over time. And it's definitely one thing to watch over time as well, but it sounds like at this point that that at this moment is not going to happen. So, that is going to be today's NASCAR news and motorsports news video. I want to thank you guys for watching. Please like, subscribe to the channel, notifications on, so you know if I win a video, does go live on my channel. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and support me on Patreon as well. Link description below that, and comment below your thoughts below on today's episode. Do you think 2011 stays with Toyota, or do you think they switched to four? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And what are your thoughts about Kurt Busch, and what do you think about his whole entire career? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Later today on the channel, the NASCAR Xfinity Series race fix from Darlington Raceway. Tomorrow on the channel, we have the 2024 NASCAR Cup Series playoff predictions. Then on Wednesday, we'll have a NASCAR news video on the channel. Thursday, we'll have race fix for the Southern 500. And then on Friday, we will have a NASCAR news video on the channel as well. I have a lot of great content dropping on the channel that I cannot wait to share with you all. So anyways, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's episode. And I'll see you guys next time for more great awesome NASCAR content and other motorsports content on the channel like this. Take care, everybody.